Right, good morning everybody and welcome to the SMI's weekly seminar. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land in which we meet today. On behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contribution to Australia and global society. Today's presentation is presented by Associate Professor Paul Gow um, from the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Center, or affectionately known as the BRC. Um, Paul is discussing his research findings on the rover field to the southwest of Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory, which are included in four new publications. Uh, Paul has over 20 years experience working in the mineral exploration and development, and has worked on projects in Brazil, PNG, Chile, and Australia. He specializes in the utilization of diverse data sets to better understand the controls on mineral deposit formation and to target discovery and delineation of new mineral resources. Paul, I'll hand over to you in a moment, but as always, everyone, please can you submit your questions via the Q&A button, and you can do this at any time during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I will then put those questions to Paul. We also have a guest um, who uh, Paul will introduce shortly. So Paul, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Neville. I'll, uh, I'll just quickly share my screen and get the uh, presentation rolling. There we go. Um, yes, thank you, Neville. And um, I, I should note that uh, Neville was referring to our special guest today, who is, uh, is Dot Close, who's dialing in from, from Darwin. She's the Director of uh, Regional Geoscience at, uh, at the NTGS, Northern Territory um, Geological Survey. Um, and, and we certainly um, have, have enjoyed working with the NTGS and we thank them for having, uh, having us uh, involved in this, this project. Um, yeah, so, so what, um, what we've been uh, collaborating on with the NTGS is, is some work out around the uh, Warramunga province, which sits in, in Central Northern Territory. Um, and before I say much more, I guess I should, um, should, should make the comment that whilst I'm talking today, um, most of this work was actually done by others. So, so I should uh, acknowledge what they've done. Uh, Rick, Rick Valenta did, uh, did all the work on the, um, on the solid geology interpretation. And uh, Jennifer Gunter put together all the, um, all the 3D models of, of the various deposits as, as well as the regional data sets out there in the, uh, in the rover field. Um, and we were, that was also supported by um, Sasha Ivas Porpogo, who uh, is a geophysicist and, and helped us out with that uh, aspect of the work. So thank you to uh, all, all of those uh, people. Uh, now, uh, to, to let you know, I guess some of you may not be overly familiar with the Warramunga province. It sits in Central Northern Territory and, and you may in fact know it uh, a little better through its, its, um, its hosting the Tennant Creek um, mineral field. Uh, which is, is an historic uh, mineral field, as, as most of you probably know. Um, look, the, the Tennant Creek is, is an area of exposed um, rocks in the middle of um, the territory there. Um, they're Proterozoic rocks, so, that, so they're reasonably old, 1850 to 1650 million years. Um, and and the, the Tennant Creek mineral field is on the exposed portion for the, the bulk of it, um, which, which is essentially why it was, it was discovered first and, and developed um, first um, before other, other areas around there, such as the rover field. Um, and, and part of the brief of, of the project that we've been working on is to say, well, we know that uh, the Tennant Creek um, mineral field is, is highly mineralized with, with high grade gold and, and high grade copper, possibly minus bismuth um, deposits. Um, what, what about uh, elsewhere? What, what's the potential that sits around that, um, the, the Tennant Creek area under cover in the rest of the Warramunga province? Um, so, so essentially you have the outcropping Tennant Creek um, area and then out to the east you have the, the Georgina Basin and you'll, you'll see that on this, on this map. So the Georgina Basin is, is the pale yellow material which are the, the Neoproterozoic to Paleozoic basins and then out to the west you have the, uh, the Wiseau Basin. Um, and as you would imagine they thicken from, uh, from the outcrop at Tennant Creek out to the, uh, out to the east and the, the west. Um, so, so the Tennant Creek um, mineral field, uh, as, as an introduction, because it's obviously high, highly relevant to, um, to what we're looking at out in the, out in the rover field, 
Um, it, it was discovered, I guess, back in the, in the 1870s, I think it was. Um, the, the, the gold was discovered in those days, and it was typically thought that the, that the gold was associated with the quartz veins, uh, as, as is sort of common in so many other fields, for example, such as in, uh, in Victoria that was being worked in, in the 1800s. Um, and, and then it, but then it wasn't until uh, there was some more work done, and, and then in the early 1900s, I think it was about 1920, there, there, was, there was another raft of, of discoveries of the major larger deposits. And that was essentially based on the back of people starting to understand that the high grade gold and copper was not so much associated with the quartz veins, but with, the, uh, with some ironstone bodies that, uh, that are so common throughout the Tennant Creek um, mineral field. So it was, it was one of these cases where, where you have a, a change in the, the deposit model and for how, it's, uh, how, how people understand the deposit, which gives them different indicators as to how to explore and discover those deposits. And that, that paid off um, in spades in the, in the 1920s in the Tennant Creek mineral field. Uh, and and since, since then, I, I guess production continued throughout the 1900s and it pretty much tailed off in the 1990s, although there was, um, there, there was a bit of, um, I guess, smaller scale production this, this century. Um, now, as, as, so we understand what, what could potentially be under the, under, under the cover in the rover field. I've listed the, the key deposits here um, at, in, in the Tennant Creek field. Um, and now what you'll see is, is this, this is the, obviously the name and the, the tonnage and the grade of the deposit and then the percentage of the um, total, total gold production from the field. So you'll see that there are about four or five deposits that, um, that provided the bulk of the, the gold that was mined from Tennant Creek. Um, and I, I guess the important thing that I wanted to point out from, these, um, from this, this list of deposits and their grade tonnages is that, um, and I've highlighted in bold here, I hope you can see, for example, Juno, um, the, the average, whilst it's a, a relatively small deposit, the, the average gold grade is, is up at 57 grams per tonne, which is, which is you know, fantastic grade. And then even if you look at the copper, copper deposits as well, the, the Pico deposit, um, and its average grade was 4% copper. Um, you know, obviously if they were mined these days, that, that um, average grade would, would be taken down, down a little bit because the grades being mined obviously are dropping with time. But I, I think it's important to understand that, that when, when you have those sorts of grades, it, it, opens up a, um, it opens up a university of opportunities, a universe of opportunities, I should say. Um, and and so, so that when you're going undercover, you need that, you need that high grade um, because presumably you, you're going to be mining underground if, if, if the cover's getting, uh, getting deeper. Um, and so you really need those high grades to, um, to be able to, to go into development. Um, so, so to look at, look at how the rover, uh, rover field um, relates to the Tennant Creek field, um, if we, we go back to the, the 1960s, it essentially was. So that what, what, what I have here is that same map previous, as previously with the, um, with the main deposits. Um, and what you can see is um, contour maps of the old, old contour maps of the data that was collected by the Bureau of Mineral Resources, the, the, the BMR, uh, uh, now Geoscience Australia, who, who do so many wonderful regional data gathering um, exercises. So back in the 1960s, they, in 1960 actually, they flew, flew this survey you can see down to the south here. Um, it was larger than this, but the, the maps I managed to get hold of covered these areas. And, and that, that um, airborne survey was, was flown at, at line spacings of, uh, I think about um, 1,500 metres, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 metres line spacing. And then in 1964, they uh, flew a more detailed survey over the Tennant Creek area. So you, you can see that, uh, that, that contour map here. And so it was on the back of this new data collection that um, particularly Geo Pico, who was working in the Tennant Creek uh, area at that time, uh, recognised that on the basis of the magnetic data, they could think about um, Tennant Creek style mineralisation out and extending under this, um, under the Wiseau Basin. So, so this, you may be able to, I hope you can see it, is this, this is the border uh, here in, in pale, um, pale grey of the Wiseau Basin. So that every, everything at that time, essentially to the west of that um, basin margin, was, was in, invisible and anything in the basement was essentially invisible um, until these sorts of um, aeromagnetic surveys started being flown. And then in, the, uh, in 1972 to 1977, uh, Geo Pico uh, discovered the Rover 1 deposit here. 
Uh, and then in 1979 to 82, they discovered another couple of deposits out here, Explorer 142 and Explorer 108. Now, why, why we've focused on these three deposits is because they are the three deposits out in the rover field that have um, um, uh, jork, jork sufficient, um, jork compliant um, mineral resources uh, estimated for them. Um, so, so that's a bit of background um, about how the step out happened from, from Tennant Creek out to, out to the rover field. Um, so, so I, I guess that's the point at, at which we say, well, what, what was the next step? Some of those deposits had been found. And those, whilst those three deposits are shown here on, on this map, there were many more, many more targets drilled. And, and you'll see from, from the naming of these targets, Explorer 108 and Explorer 142, uh, the whole sequence of, of targets that were drilled out through this area were, were often called Explorer uh, with a number. So you can see that there were a lot of um, targets tested. And, and it was a relatively simple targeting mechanism looking for um, magnetic anomalies uh, undercover that might represent these uh, ironstone uh, type ore bodies that we see at Tennant Creek. Um, so, so Rover 1 and the two Explorer deposits were essentially found through putting this, um, this airborne magnetic data together with obviously more, more detailed data that was flown afterwards and ground magnetic data, that is data collected by surveying on the ground um, together and following that up with, uh, with diamond drilling to, to find these deposits. Um, so if, if we step um, forward, um, this, this is the modern aeromagnetic data. I, have, I haven't put in the detailed data but at this scale, but um, this is the regional uh, airborne data and you can see it provides a lot of uh, information about what's happening under those um, covered areas in the Wiseau Basin to the west and then the Georgina Basin to the east. Um, and Geoscience Australia has, has recently um, done some M MT work, I think it is, um, that they call their, their East Tennant Creek um, survey, which sits out in this Georgina Basin. So there's work heading out to the west and east um, from, from Tennant Creek. Um, so, so the rationale was to say, well, we know what's at Tennant Creek. We know some of these, um, these targets that exist out in the rover field and where mineral resources have been defined. Um, what's, what's the next step? because uh, essentially, um, you know, exploration activity out there, these deposits were, were discovered in the, the 1970s and early 80s. Um, what, what, what's the next step? So, so the obvious thing to do is to take these new data sets and, uh, and essentially map the, what we call the solid geology, um, which, which is, is what we think the geology is at the basement surface underneath that thin veneer of um, later flat lying sediments. So, um, so Rick, uh, Rick has done that, uh, that exercise. Um, so so ha having a good look out and, and we said, well, where, where, where do you want to look at all of this uh, data and, and where do you do, draw the limits? Because you know, how, how long is, is a piece of string? Um, and so, so what, uh, what we essentially did in conjunction with the NTGS was to uh, define an area in which uh, that, that solid geology interpretation would, would happen. Um, so, so this is essentially what, um, what we came out with. Um, so you can see the solid geology map here overlaying on the regional magnetic data. And then within that area, we, and, and, and I should say that's the, the scale bars here, but that's essentially th this area with the solid geology interpretation is about 220 kilometres long by about 80 to 100 kilometres wide. So, so a very large area. And it's, it's, it's interesting when you look at, look at this map and we know what style of mineralisation is out there. This is a map where these green dots represent drill holes that have intersected the, the basement um, below the Wiseau Basin. Um, and so you can see where the drilling has been, uh, been clustered um, and, and that there is a lot of uh, expanse of, of what we interpret to be similar rock types uh, further out to the west and northwest here uh, that, that um, you know, have, have not had a lot of um, serious exploration work done on them. And, and that, that's out to these deeper areas to the northwest, but it's, it's also, um, I think there should be some more drill holes down here that I've obviously missed, but, um, but there's also this area to the east that uh, has, has not been as heavily hit as this, this main rover field area. So that was the regional geology. And then there are these three uh, deposits um, for which Jennifer Gunter put together um, some detailed um, 3D compilations, including some sort of grade and, um, and geological modeling that, um, that she undertook. So, so that's, that's, that's the key areas, the, the broader uh, solid geology area, and then the, the central uh, area that we focus most of our work around the known mineral resources. Um, 
So talking about cover thickness, it's obviously critical out here. I mentioned earlier that, that certainly at Tennant Creek, there is, there is high grade mineralization. And, uh, and we, we see out in the Rover field, there's certainly high grade copper mineralization at Explorer 142. Um, so that once you start thinking about those sorts of grades, you can start to um, start to think about what sort of cover you can be, uh, you can be working under, um, where, where you can explore, develop and, and, and operate. Um, I guess we've seen from places in uh, South Australia, for example, out on the Stewart Shelf, which, which is the, part, the eastern part of the Gawler Craton around uh, Olympic Dam. And uh, out, out there, for example, Olympic Dam is, is being, uh, being mined un underground. And there was even uh, several years ago talk of putting in a, a large um, open, open pit. Um, and, and that's under about 250 metres of, of cover. So you either, either, either obviously need the grade or, or preferably the grade or, or a very large ore body to be going under those um, thicknesses. And, and I guess down on, on the Stewart Shelf as well, you start looking at um, things um, like the Oak Dam uh, deposit. Uh, or I'll call it a deposit, but um, it was probably about six months ago, I think the BHP released their, their drill intersections um, uh, for, from Oak Dam. And, and I, I can't remember what they were, but there was you know, 800 metres of 2% copper or something on those orders. So, and, and that's under, I think, about six, 600 metres plus of, of cover. So there's, there's, certainly, um, there's, there's certainly a precedent of, of operating mines un, under this sort of cover. Having, having, now, having said that, um, we're still not sure what, what the cover uh, thickness might be as we head further out to the northwest in the Rover field. So, so if, if we look at the three deposits that we've looked at, um, there's, there's Rover um, is under 130 metres of cover, Explorer 142, 220, and Explorer 180 uh, metres of cover, which is actually um, a, a little bit shallower than, than what had previously been estimated. So this background image is the uh, is the Oz Sea Base um, data set that FrogTech um, put together. I, I guess it's quite a while ago now. Um, they, they essentially did this exercise over much of Australia um, using both geology, drilling, and modelling of, of geophysics to to try and understand what what the cover thickness was. And um, and and out here on the rover field, it looks like um, it's it's turning out to be a little bit shallower than uh, than that had been uh, estimated. Which, which is positive for, uh, for discovery out, to, out in these areas. Um, so look, to, to look at, at the sort of products that, that um, have been included, um, I think as, as, as Neville may have indicated earlier, um, we, we've put, put this work out as a bunch of products through the uh, NTGS, uh, that they have a, um, a, a series, they call their DIP series, um, Digital Information Packages. So there have been four packages go out that have uh, all of this data because the, you know, the obvious aim of, of us doing this work in conjunction with the NTGS is, is to help explorers understand what the potential may be in uh, these areas and, and how, they, how they can potentially target. So give, giving them a head start with, with the basement geology and the mineralization styles that um, might be out there. Um, so, so the first thing that, um, that, that has gone out is, the, um, is essentially a, a GIS, um, containing the, um, the, the geological uh, interpretation. So th this, this is the interpretation uh, that, that Rick has completed within that, um, within that tighter area around, around the deposits. Um, there's a lot of attribution to the data sets. Um, so, so that, um, I guess, firstly, what we had to do was go through all, 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 of, the, all of the drilling. Um, so we incorporated, uh, I think it was 420 drill holes that, um, that intersected basement. Um, and, and within that 420 drill holes, there were on the order of, I think, 16,000 different um, uh, intervals logged for their geology. So, so you can imagine with so many different companies, what a, um, I wouldn't use the word chaotic, but it, but it was a, a somewhat scattered um, log, logging approach. So uh, Jennifer spent a lot of time running, running through that data set. And, and essentially, we, we tried to consolidate all of those uh, rock types that were described with, it, with their intense alteration in places down to, I, I guess, approximately about 20, 20 lithological units here, so that we would have broadly consistent um, geology across the area. So on, on, on the back of that, that was obviously one of, one of the inputs to, um, to, to the interpretation that, that Rick um, was doing. Um, and, and so on, on the back of that, the, the GIS has been attributed. So for example, the, uh, the lithology layers uh, have, have all been, um, this is what, what I, I have up here. It's a snip from, from ArcView, ArcMap. 
Um, so, so basically, the, the, they've been nominated with, with probable stratigraphy. Um, there's an estimate of what their lithology uh, rock type might be, and then within within that um, within in that uh, lithological data, oh, sorry, that um, the rock type um, layer, there is also I've, I've not shown it here on on this table, but there is also information about what uh, the, the geophysical um, response or, or signature, I should say, of those um, of those different rock types are. And, and the geology has followed on from, the, um, from the, the geological code and scheme that was used by the NTGS in, in their Tennant Creek um, solid geology interpretation, I think back maybe 2004. Um, so that you'll, you'll see here that uh, a lot of the, the geology, there's, there's such scant information that the geology coding is, is actually on the basis of the, the geophysical signature in some instances. So for example, you can see here P-O-M-M, uh, which if you look down here is the Uridigi group um, and the MM is for the moderate magnetic um, signature. So, so there are a couple of, um, so, so sometimes these rocks uh, are coded based on their stratigraphy or their stratigraphic unit uh, as well as their um, geophysical signature. Um, so, so, so that's basically the interpretation of the rock types. Uh, the, the other part of this, and it's, it's clearly very, very important, Given, given what we see the structural controls on, on mineralization of Tennant Creek, as well as the deposits that we see here, which, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, so, so that structural control is obviously very important. Um, so, so Rick has, has um, as part of his structural interpretation, has, and, and it's gone into the GIS data, database, is an interpretation of um, the, the style of the, of the faults uh, and or shears, um, you know, whether they're reverse or dextral, et cetera. Um, and, and the other part is they are coded for, for different um, deformation phases, for example, the, the Tennant or, or the Davenport, um, if they're reactivated. Um, so, so that each one of those structures ha has a bit of history uh, attached to it. Um, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, it's a really nice um, job that Rick's, Rick's done. Uh, so that's been put out as, as a data package and it's, it's been disseminated in um, all, all the standard GIS um, type formats, um, ArcGIS, um, map info and, and QGIS. So that's, that's available for download through the GEMIS system at the NTGS. Um, so, so that was the solid geology. Um, the other thing that um, we looked at was, were the key, um, key mineral deposits, as, as I've suggested. Um, so that this, this is their, um, their mineral resource estimates here. Okay, they're JORC compliant. Um, so you'll see that um, Rover 1, essentially is, is reasonable gold grades and good copper grades um, and nearly 7 million tonnes and it also has bismuth in its mineral resource. Uh, Explorer 2 is, uh, sorry, Explorer 142 sits over here and it's a, it's, um, a, a lot smaller, I guess, but uh, interestingly, it, it has the, um, the high copper grades. So it represents the high copper end of the spectrum of these style of deposits. Um, and then Explorer 108 Curiosity is, is out here to the, um, to the northwest and, and it's essentially the, um, the, the different, um, different deposit out, out in the area. So it's, it's um, zinc, lead, silver mineralization. You can see the grades there, 3.2 zinc, 2% 2, 2, um, uh, lead and 3 grams um, silver. And there's also a, a copper portion defined, which I assume is, is included within that, um, that uh, 11 million tonnes. Um, so what, what, we've, um, what we've done, as well as the, the GIS and the um, 3D geological models that um, we put together, we've also put a short um, PDF, um, no, I guess Atlas type, um, Atlas type document together, which, um, which describes the mineralization and, and particularly what it looks like in the key um, exploration data sets. Um, you know, at being out here undercover, obviously focused on, on the geophysics, but, um, but there are some interesting uh, geochemical aspects. Uh, so, so I've put a summary here and, and I guess I won't go through it in detail, but there are probably two key things to note from this table is one, the, there are a lot of similarities to Tennant Creek, ranging, ranging from the, um, from the, metal, uh, the metals that, that are included to the, to the host rocks, etc., and the structural controls. Uh, but the other thing to note is that um, these, these three deposits are, are, are all somewhat different. Um, so Rover 1 is, is the gold copper deposit. With, uh, with bismuth. Explorer 108 is, is the, the oddball, zinc, lead and silver. And Explorer 142 is the, the copper rich um, deposits. So e e even with the resources that have been defined in this, this small area, there's quite a spread of, um, of deposits. 
Uh, so this is what they look like in, in drill core. So you can see that there's essentially what I've done is taken, taken some shots here of the copper gold mineralization. So you can see in, in this, this, all of these are from the Rover uh, deposit. So you can see essentially here that it's, it's a massive magnetite ironstone in this case with chalk pyrite um, mineralization and, and veining and, and brexiation and replacement, I think. Uh, and then, then also from the deposit, we, we see um, this is another ironstone, but it's a lot more hematite dominant. So there is, there is that variation in, in your iron oxide within the one deposit, suggesting either diff, you, you've, you've had different fluids at different times, or that fluid, has, that, that fluid that um, was depositing your ironstone was, was close to the, the magnetite hematite um, uh, buffer in terms of oxygen fugacity. Um, and here, this, this is a quite, quite impressive photograph of, of the, um, from Westgold of the, uh, of the massive um, copper mineralization at, at Rover. So it's basically massive um, chocolate pyrite. And then over here on the, uh, the right-hand side is some example of core from um, Explorer 108. And so you'll see it, it looks very different. Um, whilst it, it does have iron oxide associated with it, it is not quite as dominant as in, in the copper gold systems out there. Um, but instead, what, what, what is a very common um, alteration mineral there in terms of volume is, is dolomite. Um, so you, you can probably see that in this photo, the white, uh, white dolomite through this area. It's obviously um, high, highly sheared uh, here. And uh, you can see that there is galena and sphalerite semi-massive with that, with that um, dolomite. So, so two, two different styles of mineralization essentially represented in those three deposits out there. Um, so, so I was talking about um, you know, the, the common exploration data sets. Um, so, so I've, I've quickly whipped up the, um, some of the diagrams from, from our Atlas chapters that, that are available uh, with the digital information package um, of the aeromagnetic signature from those, those three deposits. And you, you, you can see that they're all, all broadly, broadly similar in terms of, of almost being discrete magnetic anomalies. Uh, and then the um, residual Bourget gravity data, which, which detailed gravity data was collected over, um, over, over these deposits. And, and it's not quite as clear, but they, they certainly, as you would expect with, with associated um, iron oxide, um, that they do have, have a gravity um, response as well. Um, and just before we get into the 3D model, I just thought I would, um, would, would talk briefly about the, the geochemistry. Obviously, if you're under um, you know, one, one to 200 metres of cover, it, it's a lot more difficult. But um, all of the deposits uh, that we've looked at out there are all outcropping at the, um, at the unconformity at the top of the Proterozoic um, rocks. So, and, and even, uh, for example, at Explorer 108, you can see that, that there, there is, I think it's about 10 to 30 metres topography on top of the, uh, on top of the deposit. So that, that if, we, if we look back to when, when the Proterozoic was being eroded and just before deposition of the, the Cambrian sediments on top, um, it was essentially a, a topographic rise at the, um, at the mineralization at the deposit. Um, so what I will do is um, I'll quickly start up um, Geoscience Analyst. Um, so so what, what we've done um, both here in the Territory and we, we've also done a lot of work in Northwestern Queensland in putting together um, 3D uh, compilations of, uh, of mineral deposits. And, and uh, I should, should note again that Jennifer Gunter um, has, has put this one together. Um, and and the, the aim is essentially to, to put all of that information about mineral deposits in context. Um, and, and you know what it's like, you, you go and read a paper and it says, well, well, this is the grades and, and, and this was an interval and these were the rocks and, and they might have a couple of sections or, or plans, but, but you don't really get an understanding of, of how it all ties together. Um, so, so these, uh, these, 3D models that, um, that, that can be, um, well, they're essentially open to geoscience analysts. That's what we put them together for, which is, which is free um, software package um, from, from Myra Geoscience who are involved with GoCAD uh, development. Um, so they can be downloaded and, and we have the geoscience package, but we also provide all of the, all of the data that we've compiled in other formats, for example, surfaces as, as DXF formats or, or data as, as simple um, CSV files, etc., so that you can, you can take this data into whatever is your, your favourite um, 3D environment. 
Um, so, so this uh, this is this is the model. I'm, I'll try and move it slowly because I know it's, it can be a bit overwhelming at times that Jennifer has put together. So, the, what what you see here is is the uh, the surface, which is pretty flat out in the rover field, and then this this surface below is the um, the top of the the Proterozoic uh, unconformity. Uh, and then you can see the other types of information that's gone in there is the um, drill holes. I'll just clip this off. Okay. Is, is the uh, drill holes have been compiled throughout the, uh, out the deposit, the uh, information that was available from, from GEMIS and, and provided by the NTGS. Uh, and we've gone back and rationalised the logging codes to try and get that, um, that geological understanding of, of, of what those different rock types are. So that if we want to have a bit of a look at the, um, at the, at the, the legend, we should be able to see what, um, what those, uh, so you, you'll, you'll see that um, we, we've coded them up based on, on their colours, obviously. So, so for example, the pale, pale is, is the, the post-proterozoic cover, and then you get into these different uh, rock types down below. Um, now, I, I won't dwell on this too much, but um, it's, it's absolutely um, fascinating. Um, what, what Jen has, has drug, dug out of the data is, um, is and, and she's represented with these orange surfaces which are actually the, um, th there's, there's copper enrichment in the base of the Wiseau Basin, the, the later, later sediments, which I, I guess we presume is, is chemically remobilized. Um, but that, that copper rich, rich blanket, um, and, and I think here these orange uh, surfaces are the, are the 500 ppm copper level, um, and, and that sits over the top of the um, Explorer 108 uh, deposit. Um, which, which, is, which is very interesting if, if you're looking at, a, um, at, a, at an exploration target. You know, if, if you can take that blanket, the bigger you can, you can make the, the halo of your deposit, if you're exploring undercover, the better. So um, that, that obviously extends out to where the, um, where, where the um, drilling is. Um, and, and it would be really interesting to know how much further out from the deposit that, that copper halo extends. And, and it's quite, quite fascinating. I was looking at it yesterday and, and it, it looks like there's even up to um, you know, 5,000, half, half a percent copper in, in some, some of these cover uh, samples in, in the drilling. Um, now, one, one more thing that I wanted to show you, which I think is quite nice from these, um, from these models, is the, um, is the high logger. So we've, we've taken the high logger data um, from, from a couple of holes that were drilled out at, at it's, it's a little zone that hangs off the edge of Explorer 108, which has been termed Curiosity. So I will um, turn off the uh, slicing and you'll see that this area down to the south is the, uh, is the Curiosity area. I'll just turn off that um, top of Proterozoic and the cover. So you can see that these, these holes, uh, I think they were drilled under an, a combined initiative with the NTGS um, funding. Um, and, and they were run through the high logger system. So that what, what we've put into the, um, into the model is all of the, um, is all of the, the, I'll just zoom in on this, is all of the um, photos, sorry, oh, the core photos from the, uh, from the high logger. It, it does the line scan as it's being uh, logged. So you can see all of that uh, information. And then as well, um, I'll just turn off that cross section. As well, we have put in the information about the indicative mineralogy. So that these curves, for example, that you see here are the, um, this, this uh, purple curve is, is the lead assays and the, um, and the yellow curve is, um, I, I think it might be, um, it's, it, anyway, it's what, one of the, the minerals that is, is mapped by, um, by the high logger. I'll just quickly turn, turn that on uh, and we, we, can, uh, we can have a look. Oh, and anyway, the, 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 the data's in there somewhere. Um, and and it's, it's, it's quite interesting that, oh, here we go. So that's albite, okay? So, so that yellow is albite. Um, a, another interesting uh, zone down here is the dolomite. So you see there's a little bit of dolomite uh, alteration mapped with uh, the high logger. Uh, there's a lot up the top here, but that is essentially in the uh, in the, the Wiseau Basin uh, cover cover sequence. So all, all of that data is 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 sitting there um, in in the um, in the model, and so you can you can download those. There is um, obviously Explorer 108, Curiosity, uh, Rover One, and uh, Explorer 142. So that's um, geoscience uh, analyst. I will um, now.
go back and, and finish up quickly because I can see time slipping away. Um, so, so I guess then, um, you know, what, what are some of the implications of this work? Well, firstly, correlations with the Tennant Creek mineral field. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, um, structurally controlled mineralization, locally high strain, um, fine grain sedimentary rock host, although mind you, there is um, more of a volcanic component out in the rover field. Um, and, and I guess that's, that's just, that along with the geochronology is why um, it's being interpreted out here as the Urudigi formation, which sits above the Warramunga formation that's present at, uh, at Tennant Creek. Um, other similarities, uh, lower green stratus regional metamorphism, um, certainly the um, mineralization coincident with ironstone bodies. Now it's not only the copper and gold uh, mineralization that's coincident with ironstone bodies, bodies as at Tennant Creek, but the, the lead zinc uh, mineralization at, um, at uh, Explorer 108 also has significant iron oxide. Um, the metal association obviously is somewhat similar to Tennant Creek and the alteration assemblage, um, you know, at, at Rover and Explorer 142, it, it essentially is chloride dominant and, and the quartz magnetite hematite that comprise the ironstones. Um, differences, as, as I mentioned, the, the Uridichi group um, host sequence is different to the older Warramunga formation that is present at, um, at Tennant Creek. Uh, and the um, to my knowledge, I, I haven't delved deeply enough into the Tennant Creek field, but I, I don't think we see there so much, um, su such a deposit as Explorer 108 with the zinc lead um, silver mineralization. So, so a lot of similarities, but some, some differences to the Tennant Creek mineral field. So then you start thinking about, well, what, what are the implications of all of this for, for exploration, which, which is really what, what this work is, is driven at. Um, um, I guess the first thing is, is high grade gold and or copper, for example, the 5% um, average copper grade we see at Explorer 142 um, allows underground development. So, so to a certain extent, you can tick, tick that box and know that you, you can, be, can be working out here. Um, there's um, strongly structurally controlled mineralization. So it, it obviously requires a lot of work on uh, understanding the structure, particularly the location of the high strain zones out here in the rover field. Um, you, you, we see from Rover 1 and Explorer 142 that, that they are essentially, I think, east-west um, high strain zones. Um, so so that's, a, that's a bit of a guide for that style of mineralization. And, and there are hints, I guess, from the cross sections that we look at, albeit with not so much drilling in, in, out here on, on the Rover field, that um, some of these deposits also sit where there is an interaction between high strain shear zones and, um, and folds, particularly um, antiforms. Um, the copper gold mineralization has an ironstone association obviously so it, it will have a strong magnetic susceptibility or density contrast um, so magnetic and gravity data sets are pretty critical and, and I guess it's been known since the 60s that that's going to be the case. Um, the potential high-grade copper systems suggest a high sulfide content and whilst you don't, you don't have that um, very high pyrite content as you have in a BMS, for example, or, or some of the massive pyrite layers like Walford Creek, um, for example, um, for another style of mineralization, um, there, there, if you do have that grade of, grade of copper, and it, it's not one of the high copper species like Vornite or chalcosite, it's, it's chalcopyrite, so, you, so you're getting more, more sulfide there per percent of copper. Uh, then, then that's suggesting that uh, there may be electromagnetic responses out here on, on, on the rover field. Um, and there don't appear to be severe conductive overburden issues in the Wiseau Basin rocks, they're Cambrian uh, rocks over the top. So, so electromagnetics, where, where you're where airborne electromagnetics, um, where, where you think you have less than say 200 metres of cover, um, or potentially, uh, you know, large loop ground um, EM surveys where you think it's getting uh, deeper and or NT. Um, other, other points I've, I guess of note are that the, the western extent of these Warramunga province style rocks, which we think of the Uridigi out here, are not yet closed off heading out to the, out to the northwest. So that a, a, even the area that this solid geology interpretation has been over um, is not getting off the edge of, of this, uh, this block. So, so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential in terms of size out there. Um, and obviously we looked at the uh, Oz sea based material, but, but cover depth mapping is, is going to be pretty important. Um, you know, I, I guess typically one, one of the ways that that's done is to model your magnetic sources and try and understand what depth is, is your magnetic basement. 
it makes it a little bit more difficult here. You, you may have noticed from that aeromagnetic, regional aeromagnetic image that as you get out further west, um, you, it, it looks a little bit less magnetic. Part of that, I think, is because you're getting deeper, but also part of it may be that, that you, you don't have quite as magnetic um, host rocks, maybe, maybe less of volcanics and, and more of your sedimentary um, type rocks. Who knows, maybe you're getting down to the Warramungas. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's important uh, exercise to be done out there. Um, now I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I know with the, uh, the invite to this, this session, um, these, these links went out to where you can find these types of um, data sets. But um, so, so they've been released on the GEMIS system, uh, which is the NTGS's, um, I guess, data, data dispersal system. Uh, as digital information packages 23 and 24 to uh, 26. So I hope that has, um, I, I guess, given you a bit more information about um, what's out on the rover field um, and what its mineral potential might be, uh, which, which we think is pretty exciting, and also how you might uh, start thinking about you going to uh, explore out there and, and start finding the next generation of undercover Australian ore deposits. Okay, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. I see the clock ticking. Thank you, Neville. Paul, well, thank you very, very much. Really, really interesting talk. Um, we've had a bit of um, conversation happening on the chat session. So um, what I'll do is I'll go and have a look at that at the end and see if there's anything there. Um, and maybe Dot, you can comment. I think you made a couple of comments and, and maybe you can pick up some of the questions that were there. Um, but maybe those that have put questions and comments into the chat, if you wouldn't mind um, just transferring that to the Q&A and then I'll work through the Q&A tab. Um, in the Q&A tab, I want to start with just a comment, and I think I absolutely agree. It says the package is brilliant. Well done. I have to admit that was incredible, just seeing the amount of data you've been able to capture. I, I, th I thought that was fantastic, and the visualization is fantastic. So I agree, I agree with that comment from, from Leslie. Thanks for that. All right, then there were a couple of questions, um, and I'll start with this one. Can you comment on the mag and grav resolution? required to detect these kinds of deposits? Uh, yes, I certainly can comment on that. Um, what, what we saw is, uh, we looked at that survey from the 1960s that the BMR had flown, and it was, I think, at about 1,800 metres line spacing. And off the back of that, zones, this, I, I haven't seen all, all the detailed exploration history, but my, my understanding would be that off the back of that widely spaced data, um, these areas were selected for ground or more detailed aeromagnetic follow-up. Um, so, so that es essentially um, the broad space, very broad space data was getting people in those days into the right place to then do some more detailed data. But obviously the resolution of your um, magnetical gravity data is totally dependent on the size of, of your, your deposit. Um, so so it's, it's a bit hard, hard to answer, but um, you know, these, these guys were, were homing into the right areas based on um, you know, more than one kilometre line spacing. That's for the ma magnetic um, system. What I should say, and I note there's a comment in the, um, in the chat about this, is um, are all of the prospects related with magnetic highs? And uh, one of the interesting things about Explorer 108 and, and its sidekick um, curiosity is that um, Curiosity is, is much less magnetic. And it's, it's, it's slightly reminiscent of, of the Goanna deposit in the Tennant Creek area, okay? So the, the Goanna deposit sits to the southeast, essentially a long strike from the Gecko deposit, but it is, it is um, a little bit deeper, and also it sits off the side of the major magnetic high, and it, it doesn't have a lot of uh, magnetite with it. And, and it, it was found um, by, um, by, by Emerson, I think, via um, airborne EM survey. Um, so, so there are these deposits, which, which is incredibly interesting. There are these deposits out there that do not have magnetic signatures. And in the Goanna case, it's, it's copper and gold. Um, in the Explorer 108 case, it's um, zinc and lead and silver. So, so there are these deposits lurking around off, particularly off the edges of these magnetic systems that, um, that, that are non-magnetic and, and, and that's pretty, I guess, exciting when you start looking out in these areas that have not had a lot of work. Mm. I, can I just add something to that, Paul? It's a, mm. I, I just can't, I can't help myself. The, uh, um, the uh, you know, one of the things about history for exploration in these sorts of areas is that, is that really magnetics has been the primary tool. Um, and so, so when you're using magnetics as the primary tool 
and that's driven all of your discoveries, then not surprisingly, all of the examples that you're working from are magnetic. Um, and there've certainly been cases elsewhere in, in, for example, some of the work that we've been doing in North, Northwest Queensland and some of, the, some of the exploration that companies have been doing in that area where they, their exploration strategy was to go out and say, where are the areas in this region that would never have been targeted by people chasing magnetics? And then they've gone out and done something else like um, electromagnetics as Paul was mentioning um, and made discoveries. Uh, on on subtle magnetic anomalies, but uh, your know, subtle magnetic signatures, but but without a strong magnetic signature. So I think there's potentially a whole new and different suite of mineralization in that region that that isn't hasn't been detectable by the one tool that's been the focus of most of the exploration. Yeah, and and f following on from that, I remember almost falling off my chair back in about 2001, I think it was, with the Prominent Hill discussion. And if, if you go and look at look at the documentation of that discovery, uh, there, there were holes drilled into this magnetic system. I think it was a kilometre to the north, maybe. And 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 it all been this work done so close to the prominent hill uh, deposit, but it, it wasn't until someone changed their model in that case, looking for non-magnetic systems, that prominent hill was was discovered. So so you know that they're out there waiting. Um, and and the corollary of that, I think, is that whilst that they may be non-magnetic systems, many of them are floating around. Um, magnetic alteration. So whilst they may not be be directly uh, well directly related, they they are indirectly related to these magnetite alteration systems. So 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 it sort of gives you a guide that there was a hydrothermal system operating the magnetite, um, but but it doesn't mean it's exactly where the deposit is going to be. All right, thanks, Paul. I'll move on to the next one. Uh, was bismuth produced from the historical sites, or is it in the tailings? Um, yeah, look, somebody else may have some more information about that than me. I know the business was produced from some um, deposits, but I'm sure there are plenty of um, tailings uh, sitting out there that, that have high business in them. And, and maybe that's something worth uh, investigating, um, you know, as, as well as those other elements such as cobalt, etc. Mm -hmm. Right. The next question is, what has Seismic done to aid your interpretation? Oh, look, we, we um, did not use the seismic data directly um, simply because um, I, I, my understanding is that, that I don't think we had seismic data running straight through, um, through, through that area. Would that, would that be right, Rick? Um, I guess the seismic, there'd be a seismic line out to these. There's no seismic running through the rover field. There is a seismic line that runs through, you know, a single, single line that runs through Tennant Creek. And I think Emerson also did, did some seismic, but, but yes, you're in the, the, um, the, it hasn't been used in this interpretation. All right. And the next one is um, just picking up, I suppose, on the previous conversation and just checking in on other techniques. So has anybody used airborne gravity at Tennant Creek Rover? Um, my, my understanding is that airborne gravity, and I haven't seen any that was completed there, but there has been some pretty detailed, um, detailed ground gravity. Um, yeah, so, so I don't think airborne gravity has been fine, but I've, I've seen the detailed ground, ground gravity uh, over a re pretty recently extensive area of, of, of Tennant Creek at sort of, I guess, 400 metre um, spacing. Mm. All right. Um, I just want to check in on... All right. The rest are just everyone saying thank you and congratulations. Great piece of work. Um, and then there are a couple, Rick, I just want to check in on process, which you've copied across from the chat, I, I gather, and put in into the Q&A for us. Um, I, I haven't, uh, hosts can't copy them ac across, so I'm just having, oh. a, having a look now to see if, um, you know, a couple of people have, have uh, made comments on the, on the history of, of discovery at, at um, at, at Tennant Creek. And I, th I think it was a little bit later than we might have said at the start in the sense that I think the first indication of gold was in the, was, was, you know, at the turn of the 1900s, but, but, uh, but the main sort of discoveries weren't until, until later. Um, I'm just trying to see if, if there's any other actual questions. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I mean, I'll just go through it. it the the yep. basement geology interpretation you showed as much more structural information around Tenon Creek and the Explorer deposits. Is that a function of the real structural complexity, data resolution, or just because that's what your focus area was? The, 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 um, 
the, the, the answer to that, and I'm sorry, I'm going to jump into that. Yeah, I was that just going to say. was the bit I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 a function of the you know there were some really you know quite good high resolution surveys done in parts of the area certainly in the row you know around the rover field but some other areas as well and um, um, you know even though I guess you could you know there you could probably say in some ways well it's better to just do a, um, you know the same level of complexity everywhere I didn't do that I just used the best possible um you know sort of level of information that could be gleaned from the data so there was some data that was as closely spaced as 50 meters so so we um you know in in that area um there was more um you know more attention paid to or you know we basically extracted whatever i could out of out of the resolution of whatever whatever was there in the data and and there wasn't any really conscious effort to to say okay well, i'm going to you know i'm going to ease off because there's no mineralization in this area because that may well be the area where the next bit of mineralization is found. So, so um, um, we just extracted whatever I could from from the, the whatever was available in the data in that area. And, and it's probably worth pointing out as well that that um, um, you know Paul sort of generally acknowledged this already, but there was a you know in terms of what we had to work from, there was a, a you know quite a detailed compilation effort done by the NTGS to pull all the geophysical surveys together into unified grids as well as providing them in in individual form and that's a really you know painstaking and 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 you know sometimes pretty difficult task to pull all that stuff together at different resolutions and specifications and that sort of thing so so it was a you know a very useful data set to work from right and i, th I see what's happened is the the questions in the chat that um have been put forward, have been answered online while we were going. Um, but I, I think what I might do is just step through those quickly, just in case people want to add a couple more comments onto that, because I realize typing mm -hmm. as you go is probably pretty quick. Um, so the next one, Ron, have you compiled drilling geochem in the Rover study area? Yes, the, uh, the drilling and the geochemistry. So, so the, um, all, all of the drilling data, it's, ge it's, it's, well, it's assay geochemistry that we could find the, the uh, rationalised geological logging and obviously the collars and surveys are all included in that uh, database as, as CSV files and also within within a regional geoscience analyst project. So, so that's definitely included. All right, and then Dot, you've answered this one, which was where the people sign up for updates and you've, you've posted a link. Um, and if anybody hasn't picked up the link, let us know and we can let you have it. Um, all right, Gordon had a question around soil geochemistry and we've said that that is included. Um, and then is there any evidence that mineralization is only associated with ironstone or is it just that only ironstones have been drilled? Yeah, I, I might answer that. Uh, I'll answer those two. There was one point about soil geochemistry. Um, we, we don't have any of that out in the, in the rover field. Um, we're, we're currently working on the Tennant Creek field where, where, where there's plenty of it that we're compiling, but out, out at Rover there, there wasn't any um, available we've included, I don't think. Um, and then the second question was, um, uh, is mineralization simply related to ironstones or is it just that they're the things that have been drilled? Um, I, there may be others who can answer this, but, but from what I've seen, most of the drilling and as you say, is into magnetic targets. So it's, it's a bit hard to know. There's obviously, you know, at, at, at Curiosity, which sits south of Explorer 108, there is not a lot of um, iron oxide. So that you, you could potentially argue that, um, yeah, that there is mineralization that is not, certainly not associated with ironstone and, and potentially not even much iron oxide. All right, Paul, Dot and Rick, thank you very much for, the, well, Paul for the seminar and Dot and Rick for answering questions at the end. and. And thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. Um, and it really, really interesting to see the work that's being done and the collaboration and the sharing of information is really, really exciting. So thank you for that. Um, just in the, in the wrap up, uh, next week's webinar will be delivered by Anthony Kung from the Center of Social Responsibility in Mining. Um, he'll be speaking on mining, social performance and elements of a strategic review. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all next week. And if you have missed any of the webinars, they are available on our website, as well as news and work that we're doing across SMI. And that can be found at smi.uq.edu.au. I look forward to seeing you all next week, and I hope you all have a fantastic spring day. 
Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks for coming, Dot. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Dot. See you later.